So I'm going to get started and allow people to join as we go because I think that I have um, we have a lot to go through today. Um, so um, I'm going to turn over to Maria in just a minute, um, who's going to take the calm as we go through. But um, welcome everybody. Um, I hope everyone is feeling well and healthy. Um, I'm glad you could all join us for our spring webinar, or early spring webinar, if you will. Um, today's focus is really on what's to come, and I'm really excited because um, as of last night at 8, 8 p.m., I was going to have to do a lot of screenshots, but um, I have a demo for you all today, which I'm really excited to share, so hopefully people will, um, will, will like this. Um, but first, you know, uh, Marie is going to take us through what our current release is, and then I will take us through what's to come. Um, really what she's going to go over is what we just released in uh, late February, early March on the knowledge portal for type diabetes, um, what new features, data sets are there available to you, and then we'll switch and I will go to what's coming between now and June um, for the platform and the resource. And so um, this will be sort of a preview really as a way to stage um, our future webinars because we'll be um, developing a, a lot of new new uh, tools and methods and data sets to share with you and we really want to start to bring you along for that journey. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Maria, who's going to um, take us through what we've got in the portal right now. Okay, great. So yeah, as Noel said, I'm just going to review our latest release, which happened a few weeks ago. Um, and first, I'm just going to go over the new data sets that we added. And just as a reminder, this is our home page and on the data pull down menu, um, the data sets page is where all of our data sets are listed and described. Um, so we'll go to that. This is that page. So there's a long list of data sets on this page, um, but you can filter them to see the ones you're interested in, either by clicking on one of these uh, data types, and then you'll just get those data sets that are that type, or by phenotype. If you click on any one of these phenotype groups, then you'll get to see the, the more granular phenotypes that belong to that group, and you can filter the data sets that way. Um, and also we have a section at the top listing our new data sets. And these are the ones that we just added in this release. Um, so kind of our marquee data set of this, um, of this release is the Agen and Diamante T2D GWAS. Um, it's a very large, uh, over 433,000 um, GWAS um, of East Asian individuals. So this just um, dramatically expands the, the East Asian ancestry in the portal. And this data set is pre-publication. It's in press right now at Nature. And um, the, the authors graciously allowed us to provide this for down, both integrated into the portal and for download uh, pre-publication. So you can find this data set. Um, well, of course, it's integrated into all the tools and interfaces of the portal. <clears throat> but here on the data page, um, it's, uh, it's described and all the, the many cohorts are listed. Um, and also on our downloads page, um, which lists all of the data sets that either we provide for download or other, other sites provide for download. Um, you can find the link to get the summary statistic files. So that's pretty cool. Um, besides this data set, um, we've also added another large data set from Giant. We, we try to keep up with um, all of these anthropometric data sets that Giant puts out because they're, they're really useful, of course, for um, studying type 2 diabetes and cardio, cardio, cardio metabolic diseases in general. So this one is um, a study of some um, anthropometric, ugh, sorry, <laughs> anthropometric traits adjusted for smoking status and, and BMI for some of them. So we've added that one. Again, it's described on the data page. Um, let's see, okay. Um, then we've also added two new data sets for ocular phenotypes. So we are um, trying to add more data sets that are relevant to complications of type 2 diabetes. And of course, there are, um, there are eye disease complications with, with T2D. And so um, we've added these two data sets um, that are for um, age-related -rel macular degeneration, um, as well as, as two of the subtypes of that condition, and also for primary angle closure glaucoma. Um, so those those are in there now, and we have a new phenotype category, ocular, that that uh, that holds those data sets. And um, this is something a little different for us. So um, uh, our colleagues um, at the Broad Institute have done a UK biobank analysis, um, an exome sequence analysis um, for atrial fibrillation, 
and they've generated gene level results from this study. And so um, they've given us a file of the gene level association scores, and we're providing that for download. So in this case, the single variant um, associations are not in incorporated into the T2D KP. They're actually, they didn't find any genome wide significant single variant associations, but their, their gene level associations are significant. So we're providing this file. And so that's just uh, the first time we've, we've done something like this um, to have a file of gene level scores without single variant associations. Okay, let's see, besides that, there are a few other new features, um, nothing too, nothing nearly as dramatic as what Noel is gonna show you in a minute that's coming up. But um, for one thing, we have our, a video of our last webinar, which was about API access to results in the portals. And there's um, a banner on the homepage that, that shows, um, that gives you access to this video, um, but also on our resources page, um, all of the videos are listed and links linked, and actually the one that appears at the top, the most recent one, you can play right on our resources page. Or you can, of course, view them on YouTube as well. Okay, um, this is a small thing, but, it, but it's an important one. Um, on our homepage, we have now added a link to the Diabetes Epigenome Atlas. Um, and this is important because it's our, our sister portal. Um, we have a lot of um, uh, cooperation and collaboration, and there's going to be more coming in the future as we add more um, epigenomic and other functional data to, to the T2D portal. So um, this, is, this is just a, a start at, at that, um, a, a, a symbol of that collaboration. Um, also, a small thing, but we've um, reorganized our information menu. We, we're, we're always trying to make it easier to navigate the site, and so we've um, our information menu now has all of the pages that give you just various types of information about the portal, um, including yeah, about is about the project. Um, collaborate tells you how to uh, collaborate with us. Policies and resources are obvious. Publications, we have a paper listing all the publications. Um, and actually, it has two tables. One is a list of all the publications that have cited the portal. And another list is all of the publications um, for the data that are represented in the portal. And then we have our, our news features and our, um, a list of, of the portal team. But then new in this, under this help link, we have a new um, form, contact form, that should make it easier for people to contact us. And so when you click on the form, you get to this page, your name and your email will already be uh, filled in there. And then um, you can select which knowledge portal you're coming from, because this is ac accessible from all the portals, and then send us a message. And we will get right back to you. Um, Okay, and finally, we have, uh, we've written up a document. We often get questions about, you know, how do I send my, my summary statistics to you? Um, and so we've, um, we've written up a document um, that really describes that in detail. So um, this is our collaborate page. And on this page, we have a link to summary stat um, instructions. And this is only the top part of the page. Oh, sorry, I'm, I keep scrolling by accident. Um, this is only the top part of the page, but there are a lot of details about what kind of files we would like, what format, um, and so forth. Okay, so that is it for me. Let me try to, whoops, oh, stop the share. Okay, I'm handing it over to Noelle. Okay, <laughs> it's all yours. And you're, you're muted, Noelle. Thanks, Maria, that was great. All right, I'm gonna share my screen and um, take us through the rest. So let's give me a moment, I'll be. All right. Can folks see my slides? Yeah, I'm assuming you can. Looks like you can. Yes. All right. Um, so I'm gonna start off kind of orienting us to where we were um, some time ago, because I think the portal started with such a very simple idea almost four, almost five years ago now, um, to make genetic and related genomic data more broadly accessible and useful with a, with a goal to make it um, ideally have an impact on our ability to understand and treat human disease health. That was its simple goal. And I think what we have achieved quite well, I think we, uh, to address this first opportunity and challenges for diabetes, you had a motivated research community was, who was willing to share data and generate data at the scale we needed from a human genetics perspective. To that end, there have been 403 loci uncovered for type 2 diabetes in recent years. Um, and I think what the portal has done very successfully so far is represent those results to you in an authoritative, definitive manner through many different means, 
um, through our predicted diabetes effector genes, through gene pages, through variant pages, through the ability to just see these results aggregated in one place. That was sort of the first challenge that we aim to address with the portal over the past couple of years. And this has been um, something that we've enjoyed doing and continue to do because the genetic data sets are still growing, growing in complexity in terms of sample numbers, but also in traits, in the richness of the traits. So that's sort of our first opportunity and challenge. But for many of these loci, we don't know the gene or the variant, thus not really knowing the mechanism. So we have a new challenge for us. We need to understand function and mechanism of many of these loci. And this is not an easy task. This is a lovely um, little graphic that Martin McCarthy made. And it basically indicates that research is needed in many areas. There are many data types. There are many methods that need to come to bear and be integrated in a fashion that we're still learning how to do. And so for us, we see our, our mandate is over the next couple of years to take on that new challenge and shift our function, or shift our focus in the coming years to function to help us understand what is the variant, what are the regulatory elements, and what tissues are these variants acting, what gene is actually happening, even if you just know the locus, and then what are the pathways, and hopefully what are the mechanisms. So there are foundational data sets needed for this, and we've been very lucky because um, there are a lot of technological and computational advancements that have created resources, both maps and catalogs and um, resources and sequence data that allow this to be possible for these foundational data sets. But also, there are a host of different data sets and tools um, that we need to bring to bear. But the first activity is to catalog and integrate these resources, and moreover, to allow you to visualize them. So this is an opportunity for us, we see in the coming years as well. And these gaps we must address are, what are the needed data sets? What do you need to go from variant to, gene, to function? What information must be captured and retained? We know this very well for human genetics data. We know what we need to track from metadata in the phenotypes, how the QC was done, how the samples were treated. But we don't know this for every type of orthogonal data set needed to understand regulatory elements, genes, cellular function, and whatnot. We also need to um, understand what methods are needed and how they are validated and represented. Then, once you have those core components, you need to figure out how to re express relationships between those things, the data types, the methods, and how to represent them in a way someone could actually uh, navigate and make inferences off of. So just to put it, to sort of summarize it, the next iteration um, of the Types to Diabetes Knowledge Portal um, really will be to marry the best of the community-driven data um, and representing that we've aggregated so far and represented platform and software architecture we built for human genetics with new data types, methods, experimental approaches from the functional genomics community. And the goal is to ultimately represent them in a fused platform to deliver insight for mechanism, magnitude, and markers for diabetes, vector genes, and complications moreover. So what are we doing to prepare for this? And that's really the, the focus of the rest of the talk. So the first is to, first most important thing is our foundation. We have to expand our data and software platform to respond to the wealth and the diversity of data coming, both the current data that Maria just mentioned and coming. So I don't know if you noticed, so this is our current platform actually. So this is, you've seen this slide many times. I think we show this in every presentation. This describes the AMP T2D data and software platform that we built over the last five years. It couples everything from data ingest, how we interact with collaborators and public resources to bring in both individual level data and association statistics, where we store it currently in a MySQL database. And we have a knowledge graph that represents the relationships of all these results coming from both our DGA, which is our integrated um, epigenomics node, and our European node for human genetics data at EBI, all culminating in a representation on the knowledge portal as you know it today. So this is the stable platform that we've built so far. But we've noticed that we need to respond to the greater challenges. And so the first is our exponential growth of data. So if you look, this is over the past year, if you've seen the uptick in data sets and normal, moreover traits that we've taken on in the last year, it's pretty impressive. But this also poses a challenge to us in representing and storing this amount of data. So first change to the platform. Um, Jeffrey Massong, who sort of leads our engineering team at the, at the road, um, has, has worked to engineer a brand new storage system for us based on cloud-based Amazon S3 buckets and Hadoop. A lot of technology there, but more of what it means is we've totally rebuilt our database to store these data from a MySQL database to these two platforms to allow us to respond to the greater need of data coming in and have data represented faster. 
So that's one major technological change we've been working on in the past couple months. The second is we have to process and store the results from new and incoming data sets. So both the genetic data sets, but also the genomic data sets that will be coming in from our partner DGA. This will include high C data, a taxi peaks, EQTL methods and results. How do you store all the representation of the results when you run this against the genetic data and the raw genomic data and then represent those results? So to that end, we've taken our knowledge graph that used to represent this, which was not scalable to the amount of data types we need to bring in and change this to something that Jeffrey developed with some of the engineers called the bioindex, which allows us to store and index the links among the biological entities and then represent them in a much more fast and robust way on the portal. So this is the new framework that we will be building and putting forth in the next iteration of AMP 2.0. What's awesome is that this resource to me needs to be represented. All the current sites are powered by the exact same data and software platform. Um, the development of the source was enabled almost entirely by the AMP TTD program. But there, are seven, there are four sites publicly available right now that, that are hosted by this platform. The resource includes three nodes, the Broad, EBI, and DGA, different components. It has six software stacks and they're growing. The data index system, Loam Stream, Locus Zoom, the aggregator, bioindex, and all the portals, and this is to grow. Our foundation is in human genetics, so we thought it was really appropriate to start naming this resource and really coining it as the foundational entity that is powered, that is, that is supported by the AMP TGD program. And we sought to brand this so that we can always sort of mark what we're doing for other community portals as we go forward. So we sought to brand it in a, in a way that will be apt for both its mission and its structure. And this will allow us to enhance the current APN website with the complete technical documentation, the GitHub repos, and all the API information needed to access the underlying results in the portal. So for that, um, we've sort of branded this new name, and hopefully you all like it. The, the portal, I mean, sorry, the platform, so data and software platform will be renamed the Human Genetics Amplifier. And this has been some work that many of us have done, and actually Maria came up with the actual name for this, and many people liked it because I think it really represents the fact that our roots are in human genetics, but our goal is to amplify the knowledge and the results from that to function. And as of last night, DK on our team came up with absolutely beautiful logo, which I totally love, um, which you can see sort of the amp in there. It looks like DNA, it looks like an amplifier. I absolutely love it. So hopefully you all do. But this is a sort of an homage to what we've done over the last five years from this platform and also allows us to have um, a very clear sense of what the platform is that's producing these portals as we go forward. So this is the platform. So that's sort of like step one. The second, so we hope to update our, our, our knowledge portal network with the, the human genetics amplifier and have all the documentation relevant to the resources, links to the, all the Locusum, GitHub, so all the um, methods and tools within the resource will also be documented there. So it'll be one place to get all access to the information about the software architecture and data platform for um, the human genetics amplifier. So what else are we doing to prepare? Well. As you know, we've, this resource we built really, really does appeal to all common disease. We've done this for cardiometabolic diseases. And so we want to sort of take advantage of the fact that we would like to expand this resource to represent more diabetes complications and moreover, common metabolic diseases, if you will. So we're very lucky for the last sort of four years now, we've worked with collaborators who are like-minded. They have human genetics data of the same scale and magnitude but in related diseases. So first of which was the cerebrovascular community who had rich stroke phenotype and genotype data um, from, that were deeply phenotyped and done in the same way that the diabetes portal was done in terms of like a community together has generated the best practices of results and standards, but they want a place to represent them. Moreover, we work with State Kath Rayson and Patrick Eleanor to represent all of the cardiovascular um, community data in 2017 with another expression of the knowledge portal in the cardiovascular disease knowledge portal. More recently, the sleep disorders came on board working with Richa Saxena. Same types of things, cardiometabolic traits, genotype, sequence, whole exome data, all definitive data sets from the community, but they want them open access. But these platforms all have some things in common. Same data types, as I mentioned before, they're all cardiometabolic diseases. So the challenge right now is they're currently available only via links in the homepage. So you have to go to each of them. It's an ecosystem, which is lovely. And they all garner the community-driven portals. 
but they're not encompassing one representation to you. So we have a challenge and an opportunity here. So you need to go to four different places to get a complete picture of your gene today. You don't wanna do that. You wanna be able to see it all in one place because if you want to know if your favorite gene is associated with stroke and diabetes, you'd like to see that in one place ideally. Um, it's challenging to sustain and make relevant four sites for a genomic resource. So there's a technical burden and duplication of efforts. And to do this right, we want to combine them and really leverage the scientific ability and capability within, and also our ability to deliver a really polished and professional site. Um, we have aligned and related disease communities. So this gives us expertise. This brings us, if we're bringing these communities together, this brings us expertise, expertise in cardiovascular disease, expertise in sleep disorders, expertise in cerebrovascular disease, and so much more. So our scientific goals are much the same. In many of these cases, they have hundreds of loci they've identified and they don't know the gene and the variant. The challenges are the same. So we believe an expanded resource will respond and serve a wider research community. It will garner that expertise that we really need. If we bring them together, it will provide a single landing spot. A merged resource allows you to query across traits. This will enhance the performance and decrease the technical burden and maintenance of a, and allow a maintenance of just a single resource. Scientifically, it will also enable multi-trait representation and query of the growing biobank results because many of these foundational biobanks are represented in all these different trait communities. And all these trait communities are working on the same foundational data set. Wouldn't it be nice to see them in one hub? But in order to do this, we must maintain the community representation of the current portals because these portals respond from a community commitment. They were the hub for their disease consortia. They're the definitive place where they point their colleagues to say, this is where your results are shared on publication in many cases. And they also represent sort of the standards of that community. So we really want to maintain the hallmark of that investment. We want to bring them along and have them part of that community. We want to make it sure that if they, in the future, they want those URLs to still exist for them. They still exist, but they bring them to the resource that is powered by human genetics amplifier, but is a single common metabolic disease resource housing all the data, the features, and the method, but still preserving the customization to different disease groups. So to that end, the first place to start is, how do you make all these challenges sort of align? And we start with sort of very simple mock-ups. What does it look like to us? And we're hoping, um, and we actually have, and I can't get to show you, so the first interface where, you know, we want a new interview to, to bring all the cardiometabolic sites into one resource. And this is the mock-up. And the first thing we had to do is figure out how do you have this common resource, but then allow a user who really cares about cardiovascular disease specifically to go into that exact same window, see that same community data set, and feel like they're in the same enclave, if you will, but also be able to navigate around the common metabolic diseases that are also brought to bear. So this has been styled by DK, who's been thinking about this with us for a long time. It's absolutely elegant. It allows you to set your default disease group. And right now, those are set by all the common metabolic open access portals. And I'll walk you through this in live action soon. But what was really important to, to Sake and Patrick and our communities and, and, and Jonathan Roseanne was, I still want my researchers in my community to be able to see just the cerebrovascular data sets in the context of the metabolic platform. So to that end, you can actually go and see within the same enclave, go just to the cerebrovascular disease view of the same data sets, tools, and features. This is a remarkably important thing because it allows that, that sort of investment to be maintained. Moreover, when you're in the different modules of the site, you wanna know where you are. So to navigate that, if you're in the CVDKP, you wanna have the right banner so you know where you are, but also if you wanna quickly go back out to the metabolic disease portal, you can click right here. Vice versa, if you want to navigate inside the metabolic place, you can navigate through, through the cardiovascular disease space. So these were sort of fundamental things we need to make sure that we were allowing people to navigate, but also maintain sort of their own um, customized view. Finally, what about data? Because these communities have spent so much time sort of analyzing, um, working through, and representing their best practices of their definitive data, they always want to be able to go back to the provenance and document where all the data come from. So what we felt was really critical is that when you represent any of these data, whether you're in any of the resources or in the common one, you want to actually always know where the data came from, what community represented these results. 
this was important styling. This allows you to filter your, this is our data page, re-envisioned to allow you to navigate by disease group. And inside of each of those disease groups, you know what contributing community the data set came from. So you know that it was def the definitive data set from this particular community that helped bring this data to open access. So that's sort of the mock-ups. That's sort of our vision of how we put it all together. So then finally, what this meant for us. So we have a new software platform. We are scaling to data sets of 232 traits. We have omics data coming in at scale with DGA pumping out new data types every day to us. We had to adapt the platform. So also because we wanted to create a new resource, which you just saw me give you the mockups, this warranted a new framework and a new user experience to serve and represent these results. So over the last year also, the other reason we have also noticed, which I'm just very glad to know is a significant uptick in our usage. We went to, we went almost doubled in our weekly usage on the portal in the last year. Not sure why, that's great. Um, we can discuss why later. We've also, as I mentioned earlier, increased our data sets. So this required a new, a new framework. Why? Well, you might have noticed, and you know, because we are a scientific resource, we are open to always doing better. If you go to a gene page on the current portal, you see this lovely spinner for quite some time. And I think that's, you know, that's fine because you're loading a lot of data, a lot of tools, but we want to do better. So I'm going to show you today is how we've actually worked to do this. And I have never done this before. I actually mean this. In the entire time I've done with the photo, I've never done a live web webinar demo because I've always said it can break, something can go wrong, it's not fast enough. Uh, Maria's never given one, but I'm going to do it today. And that should tell you why I think that this is really cool. So this team led by Jeffrey and DK has worked very hard to give us a demo of what I just showed you. So we're gonna go through that right now. So with that, I'm gonna to switch to a demo. So give me a second. So, um, let's see. so as of today, so this is the current portal. I just thought it'd be worth sort of taking you through. So if you go to SLC38, which is our, you know, our hallmark gene that we use, you're still loading. You're still loading. This isn't because I have a bad Wi-Fi. This is because we have really reached a pinnacle of like what our current platform can handle. It loads just fine and you can navigate it for it and it's great, right? But watch this, it's still loading. I'm gonna go to the new site. So this is a beta version, not for public consumption yet, not completely done, but just to give you an idea of where we're headed. So this is what we're terming right now as we move forward, um, this, this might be subject to change, the Common Metabolic Disease Knowledge Portal. And there are three tabs which you're used to seeing, but one new one, So two tabs which you're used to seeing and one new one. First, explore by region, which you're used to seeing, and I'll walk you through that momentarily. Second is explore by phenotype. And the third, perhaps my favorite, is explore by default data set, data group, excuse me. So the first, let's see what data sets you now have. So if you go here, you now see all the data sets, all 200 and some odd data sets for common metabolic diseases, all organized for you with a contributing community represented. So you have the new data sets that just came out in the recent release, with all the other ones. Now we've been working on another way to represent this because this is a huge plot, but it just gives you an idea that they're now all in one place. You don't have to go to multiple resources if you want. If you want to do a variant finder when the, when, once this new resource comes live across all these data sets, you can. If you want to run a query, all the methods will be run across all these data sets and represented to you. So this is the first time ever. And to be honest, very personally, I'm very excited with this because I wanted to see this for a very long time. So I'm very excited. I got this at eight o'clock last night. So I was very, very excited. So what else? So you quickly can go back. Now, if you're a researcher working on the cardiovascular disease space and you've been working in that group of Steve Lubitz, for example, he wants to get up at any of his talks and say, you know, we have contributed to this common metabolic disease resource, but if you want to see our data represented just alone, you can at any point click here on your set default disease group. And right now you'll default to click down to the current open access portals and you can select cardiovascular disease. And you'll immediately see the skin you're used to, community representation you're used to, and the fact that it is powered by the AMPTT resource right at the bottom here, which you will be renamed the Human Genetics Amplifier. But you also can very quickly navigate back out to the common metabolic disease framework. So this, from their point in, looks just like the cardiovascular disease knowledge portal, but it has all the data tools and representation of the overall resource. 
but it still provides the community a place to always anchor their results too. So let's go back out to the home page. And we have this for all the different data sets. I mean, and all the different communities. I presented today, I'll just quickly show you sleep, for example, another demo. Sleep is available as well. They're all available. So what's next? What's awesome is if you want to explore by phenotype, you can drill down immediately. If you're in the meta, common metabolic disease knowledge portal, you immediately get an alphabetical order phenotype list of all the phenotypes in the portal. And one of the things we have yet to work on is a really clean ontology of these because it's the first time we've had this many traits in one place. We have to represent these in a way that is a little bit easier for the, nav the, the, the user to, to navigate. But that's just one thing that started. But let's first start with region. So this is something you're used to seeing. If you want to explore by region or gene, you can type in your favorite. Let's do SLC38. Oops. Hit go. And this is where the magic happens. Look how fast that was. I'm there. I have my, my position, my gene and regions, all the phenotypes associated with it. Immediately the Zocasum plot comes up with the annotations and my top variants are represented right away for me. So for us, and then one of the things that's a cleaner and more elegant look, it is faster and it is styled in a way that I think is more responsive to our growing needs. Now we'll be putting more features and um, functionality in this, but this is just to give you an idea of the fact that we have the most data we've ever had represented. We've had the most traits we've ever had represented, but it's the fastest it's ever been. And this is totally due to the new architecture and the new portal framework. So it's pretty, pretty exciting. So with that, I just wanna show you a little video, which I think illustrates exactly what we're trying to do really fast. So just uh, bear with me for a second. So I'd show you this. So this is a side-by-side -side comparison of the current portal with the Common Metabolic Disease Knowledge Portal beta site, just the beta site. So in the time that you haven't loaded the gene page, you've been able to here, Go to two different phenotypes, switch them, have the locus zoom plots come up interactively for both. Oh wait, no, you get to go to three and see a different gene even in the time that the gene page is loaded for the old portal. And this is with more data sets than we've ever had. So I thought that was really illustrative. Thank you, Jeffrey, for making that for me of what the changes are. Moreover, one other thing exciting to show you is the second video. This gives you kind of the exact same example, but it allows you to see that you can also go to other modules even faster. So another page we've already built in the new framework is the Manhattan plot. Many of you have sent, you know, you get frustrated with the Manhattan plot because it doesn't display everything. Well, in a moment, I'll show you how the Manhattan plot now displays all the results relatively fast for you. So here we're showing that you can actually switch right off to a Manhattan plot for BMI in the portal before you even got the gene page loaded in the old framework. So I thought those are pretty cool examples. Let's go back really quickly and show you Manhattan plot. So let's pick diabetes. Hopefully you walk up, there it is. There's your Manhattan plot. It takes up the full screen, it's clean, it's elegant, it gives you the top variants, they're clickable, you can see the results. Admittedly, we're still working on feature parity, but the idea is that it's there and all in one place and remarkably fast. Go back. So it's just a beta site, but what it does is it poises us for the new data sets, new tools, new uh, questions that we will need to be asking scientifically. The reason I say that is what you haven't seen in the portal is that we don't we need to have more um, exploratory and layered visualizations. Because when you just see the results for human genetics, that alone doesn't help you. If you're trying to understand what variant or what gene you might want to functionally study in a region, you need to layer different data types. We've shown you this with our focus table, with our variant focus table, with our genes and region tab. We've started to make inroads there and in how locus soon is representing different chromatin states. But that is sufficient for only certain things. If we really want to be in a position we're allowing somebody to, to have an integrative view, if you will, of genetic evidence layered with tracks, whatever they may want for different annotations, computational results. You really need a framework that, framework that is fast and responsive. So that is the reason for this change. 
So the coming months, we're going to be completing implementation of the site for feature parity. So the things that are in the old portal, bringing them over to the new portal as they're relevant. We're going to be adding new tools and pending tools that are coming a long way. We'll be customizing the pages and the workflows to be more attuned to the scientific questions that we're trying to address. So be more about taking you from a region down to a gene, taking you from a tissue or a variant and allowing you to navigate based on whatever place you want to start. The reason we're doing this now is because it's gonna be a change for you all. You're gonna see data sets that you've never seen before in one place. You're gonna have a new, new, new user experience. You're also going to have features that you might have known where they were before, they're gonna be in a new place. So our goal in the next couple of months as we start rolling this out is to share, to teach and gather feedback more importantly, what's working, what's not, what's useful, what's not. And hopefully um, between April and June, depending on how things go, we'll be launching this open access to the world. Ideally, the worst case scenario, we'll be doing it with a big splash at ABA, but maybe we'll be doing it before depending on how it, um, how it goes. I'll go back to my slides for a second. Um, so, as you know, we have portals in other areas as well beyond the, the common metabolic diseases. We have one for ALS, which is in a totally different um, area, which we don't have as much expertise, but we've worked with um, the community leaders there to represent that data. Moreover, we're very excited to share with you some coming um, events coming in the, in the spring. So first, uh, um, I believe at the end of this month, if all goes well, we'll be launching a musculoskeletal knowledge portal with colleagues at the I. FMRS, um, particularly Douglas Keel, who's been a remarkable um, partner in, in, in getting this portal developed because they have had the same challenge we have had. They want to represent their human genetics data. I think they have something like 503 loci for bone, uh, estimated bone mineral density alone. Um, and the osteoarthritis community has some of the same challenges. But bringing their human genetics data leveraged with other omics data represented in one place has been a baby of theirs for a while. So we've partnered with them to collaborate and build a site for them on the same architecture, powered by HUGAMP, um, and hopefully made available later this month. Secondly, same um, impetus from a, another set of colleagues, Michael Cho and Benjamin Raby, local colleagues of ours, who have a penchant to make lung disease genomics and genetics data available. So hopefully in May, we'll be launching a site as well for that, for COPD, interstitial lung disease, and asthma. Um, all those communities are obviously motivated to do the same thing. We think this is also of value to us because these types of things are all common diseases. So I think we have the ability with the resource we've built, um, enabled by the AMP TGD program, to power these portals as well. So what else is coming up? We'll have another production re release in April. Hopefully we'll have an internal version of this new portal framework and the common metabolic disease resource for, for some of you to play, off, play with and hopefully a, a, a public launch soon thereafter new portal tutor tutorials and demos. Um, hopefully, if we can all go to ADA, um, we'll have an Ansari event there and exhibiting booth like we always do. Um, so hopefully we'll see you all in person there. Um, as always, this is recorded and it's gonna be posted here on our resources page along with other ones. Maria mentioned this earlier. Um, so in May, when we have this next webinar, we hope to have shared this version with you to get some feedback, have more features in it, have new tools potentially represented in beta form for you to play with. And then in July, we hopefully will be getting some feedback on this as we really, really we advance this resource and officially launch the um, next round of the Types Diabetes Knowledge Portal for the next five years, hopefully. Um, so with that, I will conclude and thank the, the fantastic team of people that I get to work with. I mean, to be honest with you, the fact that at eight o'clock tonight, the team had worked very hard to get this demo up and running is a testament to who they are and how they care. So I'm really thankful to work with them. And moreover, a great group of people across, um, across the, the ocean and across the country, Michigan, EBI, Oxford, and um, colleagues at San Diego, because they're just great people to work with and build this resource together. And moreover, the AMP partnership has been so supportive of us all these years to help us build this resource, give us great feedback, and um, really um, challenge us to do better. So that also, I'll uh, take any questions and um, any feedback. No questions, that's good. Hopefully everyone's just stunned by how fast the portal is. <laughs> I know I am, I'm excited. I can't wait to share it with you all. Um, also, if you have any feedback directly or you wanna to talk to us directly about it, please just reach out to me or Maria. Um, we're happy to walk you through anything one-on-one. -on -one. Um, again, we recorded this. And if you have any questions, um, 
feel free to, to follow up with us after. This will be posted probably within a week on, on the website, and um, we'll see many of you online over the next couple months before we see you all in person at ABA, hopefully. Hey, Noel, this is Laura. I had a question. Yeah, hi, Laura. Hi. So it would be great fun to be able to see um, how the genetics data, how the genomics data is being incorporated in to the, the portal and the different views. Will one of these um, sessions kind of focus on that? Yes, so I think the next one actually will really focus on that. One is, you know, how Locusum has adapted to do that. One is we have a, um, we have a focus table that has done some quite development around representing those data. And one is we're playing with um, using IGV, which is the integer creative genetics viewer, which is a tool that GTEx uses, um, which is a very much based on the UCSC browser of the world, you know, allows a track based view. So we're playing with several of these. And I think our next webinar will be geared toward that. But also, I think, particularly if you're like you, Laura, you have a really good sense of how to use some of these data sets and you're generating them yourselves. So I think we really want to have sort of some one-offs, um, some small group settings with you and Steve and others like that to actually ask how best to represent these because we have representation in DGA in terms of the raw data, right? But then the ultimate visualization of it um, will be in the portal. So this is something we have yet to fully figure yeah, out. We'd, so our webinars will be great around that. We'd love to be a part of that. So. Yeah. We'd love you to be a part of it. I don't think we can do it without you guys. <laughs> so, that was great. Thanks, Noah. Yeah, thank you. Anything else? All right. Well, I ended early, which is rare for, 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 for meetings, but that's good. Um, hopefully next time we'll actually have more demos for you and things that we can share with you broadly. Um, I hope this was even though you didn't have the site to play with directly, I hope you got to see what's coming and um, you'll check back with us in a month or two as we actually release, release this resource to you all. So with that, I want to thank you for your time and attention. Oh, I see a chat. Oh, my thank you. <laughs> you got it, we will. All right, everybody, take care, stay healthy. Um, we'll see you all soon. Bye. Bye-bye.